British film director Michael Winner examines a case for concern when he exposes a true crime at five past nine. This is Anglia. Civil war in Yugoslavia nears as EC peace mission collapses again. 20 people still missing as liner sinks off South Africa. Trade Secretary steps into row over uranium exports to Iraq. And London pub shootings, police fear gangland warfare. Good evening. The European Community Peace Mission to Yugoslavia has ended in failure. Talks aimed at ending the violence in Croatia collapsed after Yugoslavia's biggest republic, Serbia, staged a boycott. The Dutch Foreign Minister Hans van den Broek said Yugoslavia was now heading for tragedy and catastrophe. Mines guard the entrance to the border town of Kostanica as Croatian soldiers brace themselves for a fresh wave of fighting. The tension was tightening tonight as news that the peace talks had failed reached the front line. The Croatians had won back control of Kostanica after several days of fighting with Serbian militias. But most of the 2,000 residents had fled, deserting their homes. In one house, shattered by shell fire, a frightened dog abandoned by its owners. In the current atmosphere of violence, there's little chance of them returning. The European peace mission had collapsed. Its frustrated leaders walked away from the crisis, warning that Yugoslavia was on the brink of a catastrophe. While the majority of the warring factions had been positive about their call for a ceasefire, they'd failed to win unanimous support. As said, on uh, a number of these vital elements, the agreement of one party has lacked, and that means that uh, the discussions, in fact, are uh, stagnating, if not being stonewalled. We regret this, we deplore this, while the European ministers refused to point the finger at those obstructing their mission, Croatia's president, Franjo Tudjman, was quick to name Serbia as the guilty party. This country appears to have blown its best chance of peace. With no intervention from Europe and no ceasefire, war now seems the most likely option. The sound of gunfire soon filled the silence that followed the abortive peace talks. While neither side wanted to formally declare war for fear of being branded the aggressor, in the battle zone, Croats and Serbs fought on, determined not to give ground. Jeremy Thompson, ITN, Zagreb. A sea and air search is continuing off the east coast of South Africa after a cruise liner, the Oceanos, sank in heavy seas. About 20 people are not accounted for, but they may be on one of the ships that went to the liner's help. The Oceanus was on a cruise from East London to Durban. It lost power less than two miles off Coffee Bay. Simon Cole at ITN reports. It took more than 12 hours for the liner Oceanus to sink off South Africa's wild coast, giving rescuers vital time to save most of those on board. The vessel's engine room flooded in fierce storms. Its last message, we have heavy waves. Then most people took to the life rafts. Some even jumped into the sea as the ship foundered badly, and many were rescued by nearby craft. But it seems there weren't enough lifeboats for everyone, and around 200 who stayed with the sinking ship had to be winched aboard a fleet of helicopters, which braved the terrible conditions. People were ferried to emergency treatment centers, where one man told of being in the water for 10 hours Others criticised the crew's behaviour. The chief engineer, whose the fault was in his um, department, he got off and just left all of us. There's nothing we could do. The ships, all well, the little boats that were trying to help us, couldn't come next to the boat, our ship, because it was too rough, so they couldn't come near us. And then we just had to sit and pray. This was the Oceanus setting out just three days ago for the winter pleasure cruise. There's likely to be an inquiry into how the vessel sprang a leak and there'll be serious questions about emergency procedures on board. It was a remarkable rescue operation, and there's still hope that those missing will be found safe on other ships. The Israeli cabinet today overwhelmingly backed Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir's conditional decision to attend a Middle East peace conference. He'll take part only if the Americans overcome the problem of who will represent the Palestinians. Robert Hall in London reports. The Israeli Prime Minister arrived to chair this crucial cabinet meeting under sustained pressure from the United States for agreement on the next stage of the peace process. 
the vote from the 20-strong meeting was overwhelmingly in favour of Mr Shamir's attendance at October's planned peace conference. But three votes against reflected continuing opposition to a Palestinian presence at that conference and to any concessions on Israeli territory. We will never gain any advantages of it. We only can lose. The, all other parties that will be in this conference will be against us, including the U.S. and others. Such evident suspicion did little to dampen the optimism of U.S. Secretary of State James Baker in Tunisia to seek further support for the peace initiative. He hopes North African leaders may help him persuade the Palestinians that their presence at the conference is vital to its success. Ahead of him, PLO leader Yasser Arafat was also shuttling across North Africa. He's bitterly opposed to Israeli conditions ruling out PLO attendance at the conference. But advisers travelling with him believe a formula can be found which would enable Palestinians to be represented, thus overcoming a further obstacle to these historic talks. Here, the Trade Secretary Peter Lilly has denied that uranium exported from Britain to Iraq could have been used to make nuclear weapons. Today, he said 96 kilos were sent there three years ago, but said it was part of specialised equipment for the oil industry. Mr Lilly, refusing all television interviews today, has moved away from earlier remarks about a silly season story involving just a few grams of radioactive material. Responding to a Sunday Times report that nearly nine tonnes of uranium had gone to Iraq, Mr Lilly confirmed that a firm called Amersham International, whose business involves the handling of all kinds of radioactive material, had shipped 96 kilos of depleted uranium, which is heavier and more dense than lead, as the shielding for special cameras for the Iraqi oil industry. Of the 8.6 tonnes, 8.5 are um, medical isotopes wrapped in lead, which is extremely heavy, and dry ice, which is quite heavy too. Uh, and, and then you add on the 100 kilos. 96 kilos <laughs> of depleted uranium in six cameras. But could uranium stripped from the cameras be used to make bombs? If you put the uranium around a reactor, you can irradiate it and make plutonium out of the uranium. I don't believe that Iraq has a reactor powerful enough to make significant quantities, but quite likely they would use this uranium in research to test out the technology. But with Mr Lilly insisting and Amersham International confirming that there was no evidence that the Iraqis had ever stripped the uranium from their cameras, Labour was still maintaining that this affair, like several others, has shown that the government is not coming clean with the British public. It's not simply the opposition's duty to expose these things, it's the government's duty to tell the truth. And the more we hear about both BCCI and Iraq, the clearer it is that the government's being left than frank with the British people. That brought a strong rebuttal from the Tory party chairman. We have absolutely nothing whatsoever to hide and we'll provide all the information which is, is proper to provide and which is necessary in order to resolve these arguments. But really, I think we could do without uh, any more mudslinging from Labour. And as to the Iraqi exports affair, Mr Patton says that the supplying by the government of detailed information to the Commons Trade and Industry Committee during the coming week will start to answer Labour's charges. Michael Brunson at ITN headquarters. Scotland Yard fear that last night's killings at a pub in Walworth, South London, could spark a wave of gangland violence. Gunmen opened fire in a crowded bar, murdering two men and wounding four others. The men, wearing masks and armed with handguns, burst into the Bell Public House shortly before closing time last night. They called out the name of the man they were looking for, and according to witnesses, panic then broke out. Some customers tackled the gunmen and tables were thrown. The gunman shot five people before killing their intended victim as he tried to escape over the bar. Neighbours thought the shots were part of a fireworks display going on nearby. When the extra bangs went, we didn't actually sort of think too much about it. Um, I saw that, you know, I was making a cup of tea, I saw blue lights going past, looked out, just saw loads of police cars, ambulances strewn across the road, uh, people running everywhere. Police believe the attackers were taking revenge for the murder of a man who was shot dead in a local betting shop four months ago, and they fear gang violence may now spread. It is horrific, uh, and it is very worrying indeed, and that's why I'm determined um, as head of three area to ensure that the people who have committed this horrific crime are brought to justice. Police have appealed for witnesses who may have seen the gunman drive off in a red car. The men who were injured are under police guard tonight in two London hospitals where detectives are waiting to interview them. Harry Smith, ITN, South East London. 
Thousands of Roman Catholics and Protestants came together in a border area of the Irish Republic today to hold a rally in protest at IRA terrorism. It follows last month's murder of a farmer, Thomas Oliver, said by the IRA to be an informer for the Irish police. Northern Ireland is less than five miles from here, but Coolin had been untroubled by the province's violence until last month. The murder of Thomas Oliver brought out locals in their thousands to pray for an end to Ireland's bloodshed. We've been complacent for very many years in respect of what has been happening in the north of Ireland. And I think this is an opportunity now, I think, just to stand up and be counted. To please stop that there's no need for all the killing that's going on. There's absolutely no need for it. Thomas Oliver was named by the IRA as a police informer, a claim totally denied by those who knew him. Today, his family heard calls for tougher measures against the terrorists. Reject their intimidation by your unity, steadfastness and endurance. There have over the years been countless calls and campaigns for peace in Ireland. But the organisers of this rally believe that the IRA is more sensitive than ever before to public opinion, especially here, south of the border. It's that sensitivity, they hope, which could mean that their campaign makes an impact where many others have failed to do so before. Jonathan Munro, ITN, in County Louth. The construction industry says the recession is costing it a quarter of a million jobs. The Building Employers Confederation has added job losses over the past year to expected cuts in the coming 12 months. This multi-million pound brick-making machine has to be kept running. If the kiln is allowed to cool, expensive damage results. So it works on, and because of the recession, the usual eight-week stockpile has become this. More than five months supply, enough to build a few estates and more. There are now record stocks of bricks piled up all over Britain. If things got a lot worse, there are going to have to be many more plant closures. And the waste of it will be is that when things recover, we'll want that capacity again, but it'll be closed. The Building Employers Confederation says the recession will cost the construction industry a quarter of a million jobs by the middle of next year. There's no sign of a recovery now or even in 12 months' time. Unless we get some drastic action, um, I don't see us coming out of it very quickly. Uh, I, I wouldn't like to forecast when we're going to come out of it. It, it, it is getting worse, if anything. According to the Confederation, there are now 40,000 new unsold houses in Britain and scores of unlet offices in London and the South East, which were built in the mid-80s. Both unions and managers say the industry needs a kickstart from the government. That could be done by cutting interest rates further. Without it, inevitable decline, they say. More job losses and more company closures. Stephen Cape, ITN, Central London. Cricket, Ian Botham is back in the England Test squad. He's one of four changes from the side that lost at Edgbaston. Phil Tufnell, Alex Stewart and Robin Smith are also back. Out of the squad go Jack Russell, Alan Lamb, Graham Hick and Richard Lingworth. Soccer, the Italian champion Sampdoria beat Arsenal in the final of the Makita tournament at Highbury. The match finished one all, but Sampdoria won 3-2 on penalties. Motorcycling and Kevin Schwantz from the United States won the British 500cc Grand Prix at Donington for the third year in a row. He battled for the lead with fellow countryman Wayne Rainey before pulling away towards the end. Finally, the Queen Mother has been celebrating her 91st birthday today in quiet fashion. She appeared in public to attend church on the royal family's Sandringham estate in Norfolk. Admirers cheered and clapped as she collected armfuls of flowers and dozens of birthday cards. And that's all from the newsroom so far tonight. From the weekend team, good evening. Good evening. It's been a fine weekend for most people, but only just. Cloud and rain has already arrived in the northwest, and during tonight and tomorrow, that band of more unsettled weather moves south and east across the northern half of England and Wales, maybe getting as far as the Midlands later tomorrow, but behind it there's some brighter weather again for Scotland and Northern Ireland. See how the computer expects the rainfall to move. At the moment, most of the rain is up in the north and west, but you can see during tonight it begins to move across Scotland, Northern Ireland, down into northern England, and eventually down as far as Wales and the Midlands. But by then, much of the rain has tended to die out, as you can see. And clear weather 
coming in behind. So tomorrow's weather then, there's the band of thicker cloud and rain by about the middle of the day, I think, across northern England and down into Wales. The heaviest rain will be on the high ground in the northwest. The southeast will stay dry, I think you'll find tomorrow. There'll be increasing cloud as this weather front gets closer, but it should stay dry there with some sunny spells. And you'll find it brightening up quite smartly up in the north and west, so that by tomorrow afternoon, most of Scotland and Northern Ireland will be dry and fairly bright with some sunshine. We're just left with that band of thicker cloud down the middle of the country with ever decreasing amounts of rain. Temperatures tomorrow are a touch cooler than today for most people, 22 or 23 at best, that's about 73. A moderate southwesterly breeze and temperatures closer to about 18 in the north. That's about 64 degrees Fahrenheit. That's it for me for this weekend. There's the Sunset Times and the summary. In East Anglia tonight, temperatures will fall to around 12 degrees Celsius. Winds will be mainly light southwesterly. Tomorrow, the temperatures will again reach the middle 20s Celsius, but there'll be a moderate southwesterly breeze. It'll become rather humid. Tonight's weather will be dry with mainly small amounts of cloud and some patchy mist is likely later. Tomorrow will also be dry, although it'll become more cloudy as the day progresses. And finally, the outlook for Tuesday, mainly dry and warm with sunny periods. Next Sunday at five past nine. What do we have here? An American staying at the Ritz is joined by a sinister guest. Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering. With the new arrival comes a terrifying regime. Fire! In the beginning, I thought it was all a game. And now I realize it isn't a game at all. An all-star cast in The Man Who Lived at the Ritz. Next Sunday at five past nine. Well, next tonight, a gruesome tale of blackmail as revealed in Michael Winner's True Crimes. SOS ATF. It's OS! Uh, ATS! Cool. A plea for help to New York's Good Samaritan. We have a mutual friend who's rather worried about the company you keep. Your son has been recruited by a man called Million. Maybe I just don't give a damn anymore. It is a world of violence and death, especially death. This it's the world of the drug dealer, Willie. Is that the way you want to live or die? The Equalizer returns Tuesday at 9 on Anglia. Well, now Michael Winner exposes a true crime. Good evening. You could be forgiven these days for thinking that crime is out of control, that the police are powerless, the truth is rather different. Using all the cunning and ingenuity at their command, the police do in fact solve most serious crime. This program shows you exactly how they do it. 